Um, I'm very excited to be part of this event. Uh, my name is Georgia, and actually I will not be talking about science today, but hopefully you'll find it valuable anyway, or at least inspiring. Um, just a little bit about myself before I get started. I am an information designer, originally trained as an architect. Um, so I work in the data world, as Enrico was. Um, so I design charts, data visualization, and interfaces that let people access data in a visual way. Focusing my research on new visual languages to represent data to make it hopefully more humane, more contextual and engaging. And both in my day job and in my personal practice, I work with data in a very handcrafted way. I would say or artisanal way. I really sketch a lot with data. It is my way to make sense of information, or to make sense of numbers without limits imposed by software presets. And it's also helped me to focus only on their nature, their organization, and their deep meaning. And sometimes this kind of handcrafted approach to data produces kind of artifacts that are not necessarily what you would ex expect data set to be represented on, such as in this project I've been working on for the Molaria No More organization, where data has been used as a material to produce a narrative scarf um, to tell the story of the fights against malaria over the last decade. Um, and in my day job, I run a data visualization firm. It's called Accurate, and we are a team of 25 among designers, data visualization um, engineer, data visualization designers, and interaction designers, engineers, and software developers. Speak, speak between Milan in Italy, which is my home um, country, and New York, where we started an office a few years ago. And as you can imagine, we really work across different industries, creating different kind of data-driven digital products for both businesses and communication purposes. And this is just a pretty fast composition of some of our latest digital application. And what we do is we work very close with our clients, trying to understand their critical problems with a design-driven approach. So we design and develop the way that our clients and consequently their clients make sense of information. And we also every time try to make some time for researching um, within the company. But today, of course, I don't want to show you what, what, what I do and how I do it, but most of all why I do it, and how I think that we as visual designers uh, who work with data can make a real difference, especially now that the ways that we relate with information are really evolving more rapidly than we realize. Now that we are lucky, we are past what I like to call peak infographics. In fact, in the last 10 years, I, I believe that a first wave of infographic, data visualization, and minority style kind of dashboard produced sometimes great results, but some other times failed to represent what are the true meanings and the true stories and potentials behind the numbers. But this is not bad because actually we are left uh, with a general audience that I believe understands much more of what we do as data visualization designers much more of what we are doing in this profession, and it is an audience that is ready to welcome a second wave or more of more thoughtful and meaningful visualization of data. So I believe we should see this moment as an opportunity to jumpstart a new renaissance, a sort of revolution that I'm starting to call data humanism, where we should question the impersonality of a merely technological approach to data, and we can really start to see this moment as a revolution that aims to reconnect numbers to what they really stand for, which are more and more our lives. Because the more ubiquitous data become, the more we have to experiment with how to make it unique, contextual, and intimate. And the only example that I want to bring you today, since I really have, um, well, I don't really have a lot of time uh, to make my point, is a personal project that is called Dear Data. It was a zero technological and very laborious experiment with data that was for me the big data hangover cure. Because I can show you really tons of digital programmed application, interactive application, but lots of the times are the most radical experimentations that can spark interest, con interesting conversation about where we are going. So Dear Data was a collaboration with information designer Stephanie Pozovic. Uh, we actually met only a few times in our lives, but we decided to work together because we found out that we had many, many personal and work similarities. So we're both expat. I'm an Italian living in New York, and she's an American living in London. We're both the same age, not really going into details here. <laughs> 
we're both also only children in, in like yeah very self-centered and self-absorbed but in general we have really seemingly lived parallel lives for many other aspects that I'm not bothering you with because most importantly we both share this very handcrafted approach of working with data this very handcrafted way of working with numbers preferring drawing as opposed to coding as our entry point to get to know our numbers so we decided to challenge ourselves. Is it possible to get to know another human being through data and, and drawings only? And we started a year-long hand-drawn data correspondence across the Atlantic, where every week and for one year, we used our personal data to get to know each other. Personal data around weekly shared mundane topics, such as our complaints, the interaction with our partners, or the compliments we received, and the sounds of our surroundings. Actually, 52 pretexts in form of data to investigate and reveal a particular aspects of ourselves and our days. Personal data that we would then manually hand draw on a postcard side sheet of paper and send from New York to London and yeah, it's insane, I know. And from London to New York, um, where the front of the postcard was the data drawing and the back of the postcard contained the address of the other person, of course, and the legend, so how to interpret our drawing. And eventually the postcard arrived at the other person's address with all of the scuff marks of his journey over the ocean, where the postal service really became our third important party of our data correspondence. <laughs> So, well, during a time when everybody talks about big data and virtual reality, we of course use small data and physical postcards, you know? Well, it doesn't sound very revolutionary, but by removing technology from the equation, we were really forced to extend ourselves as designers. On the one hand, in fact, we've been each forced to invent 52 different visual languages since hand drawing with data really leads you to design that are incredibly customized to the data that you're working with. But also removing the computer from the equation triggered us to find different ways to look at data as excuses to tell us something about ourselves. In fact, since the very beginning, we conceived your data more as a personal documentary than a quantified self-project, because the key here is that we didn't only quantify numbers, but we have been adding a lot of qualitative details to our data collection. For example, the very first week of Dear Data, we chose a pretty cold and impersonal topic. How many times do we check the time in a week? So here is the front of my postcards and you can see that every little symbol represents all of the time that I check the time, order per days and per hours chronologically. Nothing really complicated here. But you can see in the legend how I added anecdotal details about these moments. In fact, the different instances of the symbols indicates why I was checking the time. What was I doing? Was I bored? Was I hungry? Was I late? Did I check it on purpose or just casually glance at the clock? And this is the key part, giving Stephanie an idea of my days through the pretext of my data collection. Something that is not possible if you don't actively add meaning to your tracking. So Stephanie and I spent one year collecting our data manually instead of relying on a self-tracked digital application and we've done it by hand to force us to focus on what computers cannot gather, or at least not yet, um, finding data also in our minds and in the words we use and not only in our activities such as, as week three where we track the thank yous that we said we received or our complaints, where I compose these musical complaints cards, borrowing a very little visual inspiration from the music notation system to show the repetitiveness of my complaints of different types over time, and their pitch, their loudness, like through the positioning of my complaints note over the line of each score, like did I truly need to complain? And explaining to Stephanie how to interpret my protest and being very honest um, about how grumpy I've been in the true spirit of sharing. But we also figure that we can find data beyond the daily tracking and make a survey of what we own, for example. Walk into our closets with the eyes of the data collector and looking for data in the way we organize and classify our clothes, how, how often do we wear them, which is actually kind of telling of one's personality if you think about it. Or exploring if we can use data to become better human beings for at least one week and perform acts to then be able to report them, like this week where we purposely smile to strangers and track their reaction. But besides the topics we chose every week, most importantly, we have been adding contextual details to our log and thus making them truly personal about us and us alone. Because if you think about it, data is a tool that filters reality in a very subjective way. And data has this power of abstracting the world. And it can really help us understanding this world according to different relevant factors every time. 
So Dear Data was a personal project that led to many exhibition and eventually to a book that has been released in September and that I'm very happy to announce today that um, has found the most exciting home as the original set of our cards has been acquired as part of the um, permanent collection of MoMA. We just got the news, so it's pretty like, uh, yeah, so we were very, very happy about that. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. But besides my personal immense joy and to my point for today, Dear Data was a personal project that has been so well received, incredibly well received. We have seen hundreds and hundreds of postcards from people who learned about the project and wanted to experiment on themselves. Even teachers of any grade that are using this format to teach their students about the data world. It, it somehow opened the idea of data to a wider audience and made it more approachable, more understandable and more easily relatable to their lives which isn't the ultimate goal of what we are doing here as people who work with data as myself to try to speak as much as possible beyond our room of experts. So, well, this is why I believe that we have to reclaim a personal approach to how all kind of data is captured, analyzed, and displayed, really proving that subjectivity and context play a big, big role in any story with data when we really want our audience to truly engage. Because if you think about it, even when we work with big data, the whole point is making it smaller, smartable, more understandable, and more meaningful for everyone's lives. So I believe this is the direction uh, we need to go, but how to achieve that? So to conclude from my experience and to tie back this personal project I've been shown to any kind of situation with data, I believe we can do it by first of all embracing complexity with data and thinking about data visualization as a tool to render complexity, the complexity of our world as opposed to simplifying it. Because we can write rich and dense story with data and we can even teach and educate the reader's eyes to become more familiar with visual languages that are really able to convey the true depth of complex stories and if we can create visuals that encourage personal engagement well people will do that then I think we do, but we do it by not relying on standard tools to visualize our data, but by producing visuals that are really specific to the type of data we are working on, as opposed, again, to relying on tools and softwares that mostly will return you with very standard charts, regardless of the very meaning of their data. There, I, there is a true value, I believe, in designing visual representations that are completely tailored to the data that you're working with. Then we do it by taking into consideration at every stage of every project what really data stands for. Probably embracing a design approach to data since the very beginning, since I think it is the true way to transform the abstract and the uncountable into something that can be seen, felt and reconnected to our behaviors and to our lives. Well, then we do it, of course, by making sure that the data we analyze don't live in a vacuum, but they are carefully woven into their context, because the more machines and applications will be gathering data from us and for us, the more we always need to stick a post-it in our heads to remind us to always sneak context in, especially when data is about people. And finally, by remembering that data is imperfect because it's primarily human made and if, if it comes from a sensor, well, a human designed this sensor and data driven doesn't mean necessarily unmistakably true. It never did and probably never will. But then we should also change how we conceive the visual representation of data and learn how to render the more qualitative and nuanced aspects of data, even the imperfection and the approximation in data. So I still don't really have a 10 words definition of what I call data humanism, but I'm dreaming of a world where data is really for everybody and unique to anyone. A data land where talking about data will mean talking about its intimate quality in conversations that will be shaped around subjective, imperfect, and even serendipitous aspect where data conventions are maybe replaced by data possibilities and where data-driven design is maybe replaced by design-driven data and where ultimately, instead of using data to become more efficient, we will all use data to hopefully become more humane. And I believe it's a compelling future to build. Thank you for now.